Welcome all to worship for this third Sunday of Advent. It is good to be with you in this way as we look forward to the renewal that is coming in Jesus Christ. Just an announcement about uh, this Christmas season to come. There will be an opportunity for a Christmas fellowship uh, via Zoom, and so that has been uh, invitation has been sent out via the church uh, um, email list for that. And then also on uh, Christmas Eve, there will be a virtual service provided, as well as an opportunity to come together in the Concordia parking lot at three o'clock Christmas Eve uh, for a very brief outdoor worship service. It's going to be perhaps a little chilly out. Um, but we will get together for a short amount of time, sing a couple of songs together, uh, hear the Christmas gospel, pray together, have communion with one another. So look forward to that opportunity. Um, remember, masking will be required, distancing will be expected, and if you arrive on that day, uh, remember to keep your car parked, um, you know, a proper amount of uh, distance from the other cars so that you're not coming in contact with people as you get in and out. So looking forward to that opportunity, uh, those opportunities to be together in some uh, many and various ways to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship. We praise you, O God, for this victory wreath that marks our days of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, strengthen our hearts as we await the Lord's coming in glory. Enlighten us with your grace that we may serve our neighbors in need. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven, and you are free, free from all that holds you back, and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once in love. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, that anointed by your Spirit, we may testify to your light. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me, has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of mighty righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt my God. For I have been clothed with the garments of salvation, covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bride bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and his bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God.
reading from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will do this. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For you, Lord, have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of your servant Israel to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we are now heading into the third Sunday of Advent. So what have you been pondering with these uh, stories for this Sunday? So my focus um, is on the Gospel of John, where we hear... Um, the opening of the gospel talking about John the Baptist being out in the wilderness, preparing the way for Jesus' ministry. 
And what really strikes me in the midst of of this um, encounter that we see between John and um, the priests and Pharisees who are sent to him is this um, focus on pointing beyond himself. Hmm. So everybody is trying to ask him, who are you? And are you the Messiah? Are you the one we're waiting for? And he continually points to Jesus who isn't on the scene yet. And I just think that's a really fascinating, fascinating image of um, a leader who's willing to point beyond himself to the the real, the real message, the real one who's important, and it it just it strikes me that that's not a kind of movement that we see very often today, um, and it makes me wonder like what is it that would cause us to to point beyond ourselves to something, or do we even think of ourselves as as John the Baptist in the way that that our call as Christians is to point beyond ourselves to Christ hmm. so that people maybe in encountering us are curious, but it doesn't become a kind of a, a cult of personality thing. It doesn't become even about us or, or how good we are or, or even how much we're doing for the church. It's, it's whatever we do is for the sake of pointing towards God. Hmm. That reminds me of two different things. The um, When we were in Germany for the Reformation tour, I think it's the altarpiece art at the uh, one church in Wittenberg, I think, um, that has uh, Luther kind of up in a pulpit and he's pointing mm. away from himself to the cross. That there's a sense of this is what it's all about, a pointing away um, to Jesus. And that also reminds me that in our Deeper Things group, we've been reading uh, The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cohn. And he's talking about how Martin Luther King Jr., in many of his final, you know, final year and final months, you know, had this sense that maybe he'd be killed. Um, but, and when you talk like that, people would try to stop him. Like, you don't know that's not going to happen to you kind of a thing. But then he would reiterate that the movement would continue on without him being a part of it. That it was, as, as a leader, he had this sense of what I'm part of is so important, not me, not my personality not specifically my leadership, but that it'll keep going without him um, for the cause of justice. Yeah, I think thinking about both those preachers, right? What a message for, for us as preachers, that sense of Luther pointing to Christ, that everything I'm saying is not about, about me, but it's about pointing to Christ, bringing people into relationship mm. with Christ. And um, I think right now, you know, for preachers, the, the pressure to measure yourself up to other other preachers when oh, all of man, us are online man. and everybody gets to pick who they're listening to, to be called back to the purpose of preaching is to direct people into relationship, to have an encounter with Christ through through whatever clumsy words we offer up that that Christ works within that to to encounter the listeners. And I think the same goes for for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is that sense of um leaders of a movement or people who have a, a great idea or have a vision for how their community might be changed. Mm. You know, a lot of times we name buildings or parks or schools after people, but in the end, that wasn't their goal. Like if that had been their goal, none of that would have happened. Mm. If the goal had been for my, my prestige or my glory, my fame, then you probably wouldn't have been able to gather all those people and all the energy and effort into creating something for the sake of others. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about in the midst of Advent as we're preparing for Christ. How does um, Christ so transform us that we're willing for it to be not about us, but about Christ? And being about Christ is really being about the well-being of the whole community. Hmm. And so that everything we do um, shows God's love and value of of all creation, of all people, not everything we do and our success shows God's favor for me Yeah, and how that kind of switches away from a lot of our culture to be something different, to be a, a uniqueness of Christianity. I wonder what you make in our gospel reading of this, you know, John the Baptist is continually asked about like, are you a Messiah? Are you a prophet? Are you this? And he keeps repeating, I am not, I am not, I am not. And I wonder if there's a, uh, a power that can be claimed in this Advent season of not only recognizing that we are ones that can point, you know, beyond ourselves to, to Christ, 
but also of like recognizing like I'm not not just I'm not the center of things, but the, the freedom that comes with knowing yourself in such a way that you can say, that's not what I'm for or what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I, how powerful that would be. You know, I think so many times we get all these messages of who we're supposed to be. Um, maybe that comes within families of, you know, the the parent who maybe expects that we're going to be the caretaker or the, mm. you know, for all of us parents, you know, we're living in a, we're kind of expected to be a teacher and I'm sitting there trying to do live with social studies. Mm. I'm like, I have no clue what they want you to get out of this assignment. <laughs> You know, and it's like, I I am not the teacher. You know, I'm not the one who created this curriculum to know what, what to do here. Um, and I think, you know, that's a special circumstance in this time. But in our lives, we get this pressure to to be or act or achieve or look like someone else's expectations. And what a freedom it would be to say, those aren't my expectations. That's not, that's not me. And I don't mm. have to be that. And I don't have to try to be that. Exactly. And I think the the power of Christ's love that we celebrate in this time, this power of God choosing to come to be among us and to say, you are worthy as you are, who you are. That's the kind of gospel that frees us from the bondage of people saying, you should be this. And why aren't you what I think you should be? Why aren't mm -hmm. you good enough? Why aren't you blah, 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 blah. We can say, I am not. I am not your version of me. I am mm. me, and I'm the ver I'm the me that Christ has chosen to love and to value, and I am enough. So I think as I read about John the Baptist, um, I also think about how he might inform how we relate to each other, not just mm. in the, you don't get to tell me who I am, and I get to tell you who I'm not kind of thing, but in the, um, the, the lifting others up. And of course, I mean, John's lifting up Jesus, you know, but I think there's, there's other ways that we can form stronger and better communities by allowing other people to shine hmm. and to help them shine. And I think sometimes we become so competitive that we we feel like we better make make ourselves look good. And sometimes that results in putting other people down. But so my focus is more on John the Baptist today. But I think you are looking a little bit more at Mary. Well, I get a little tired of these back to back weeks of John the Baptist. So the alternative psalm for uh, this Sunday um, is the Magnificat, Mary's Song. Um, actually, I think it's also a possible text for next Sunday. Um, so I wanted to focus on that as our gospel reading for the most part. And what I've been thinking about is I came across this uh, quote that's attributed to Maya Angelou, uh, the poet. And she is said to have said, A bird doesn't sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. And that quote's helping me to think about Mary's encounter with the angel and hearing this news that she is to give birth. Um, and her response is, well, how, you know, how can this happen? And the angel explains it. But when it comes down to it, she responds in song. Um, and how often is it? It makes me think about how our culture, um, our churches are so information and answer oriented um, that we think especially as communities of faith that um, what we believe about God and the world is like the answer that uh, you know we were talking about teaching Lila is like the you know the unknown variable in the equation or something it's just like oh if we just we have that answer that we can just plug in um, what if it's a little more mystical than that what if we like Mary, are meant to respond not with an answer to this or that question in life, but with a song, mm -hmm. with something from our heart, from our experience in the world, um, and that expresses our hope. I mean, a Mary song, um, it's not filled with, you know, answers, but it's filled with these hopes and these longings that the world is going to look different. Um, she gives praise to God because um, this news of a baby makes her think that the future might have those who are hungry fed, um, that the lowly would be lifted up. Um, so what would it mean for us in Advent to think, it's kind of like pointing beyond yourself in a way, that it's not about being correct or right in any way, 
but it's about cultivating an orientation to life um, with, that's shaped in a way by by song instead of answers, by by giving voice to hopes mm -hmm. of things as they could be or or that we trust will be with God's promises. Um, and it makes me think, to, once again, I had already talked about The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cohn. Um, in that book about seeing the cross in Jesus um, and, and his experience there uh, side by side with the experience of black folk with the lynching tree, um, he doesn't give a lot of theological, you know, A plus B equals C kind of things. He uses songs and poetry to bring out the experience of his people to make these connections. Um, and as a church, I feel like we we have those resources to do the, the same thing, to, to bring out um, that the reason for our, our gathering in person or this way virtually um, is to get into that mindset of, yeah, I don't have the answers, but we have a song to sing. A song of justice that turns the world upside down. I like that sense of music as being um, what maybe opens us up to the kind of thing that's on the edge of what we can imagine. Mm. And think about music and music's tendency that you might have um, kind of a set of notes and a, a rhythm and then a good musician plays around with that. We were in New Orleans last summer, oh, yeah. um, back when we could travel, and uh, you know, just for a day or two, and we went and we listened to a musician um, at the National Park, just kind of giving an example of, okay, here's a tune, and now I'm going to play it in this style, and I'm going to play it in this style, and I'm going to play it in this style, mm. to get at that sense that, yeah, there's one, one like recognizable tune, but you can play it in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think about that in the midst of Mary's encounter with God. Um, not many of us have had an encounter with God in quite that way where an angel shows up and tells us our life is going to change. Maybe some people have, but, but we all maybe are, you know, I think about like, how does God riff on that in all mm. of our lives? You know, how, how is God encountering each one of us in a different way that helps spark our response in a way that you know, plays the chords of God's vision for the future. It plays the chords of God's unconditional love, of God's care for all creation, of God's um, vision of, of newness, where things that are full of decay and death are are no more. And each of us is is kind of brought up into that rhythm, and we're yeah. we're dancing and we're singing and we're playing um, pieces of that music um, along with God. I think that's a really neat image to think about that um, each of us maybe are, you know, all God's creatures got a place in the choir. <laughs> choir. <laughs> you know, or just, about that. Yeah, so I've heard that. Um, just a, a voice in this tapestry of music and that maybe, maybe alone, sometimes we feel like we're not accomplishing much or we feel like we're not important in God's grand scheme of things. But when you think about um, like a big orchestra or something. Mm. It's it's the fullness of all these different instruments playing together and these different voices being being melded. And maybe sometimes some are quiet and sometimes some are loud, some are silent, some are, are, are constant. And it's all different, but together it creates one song of, of beauty and joy. And that that's what God is kind of doing, I think, in our midst, inspiring us to, to join God's song. And to join in... In Mary's song, um, to connect in some way to the words that she feels moved to sing at that moment. Um, to let ourselves be taken up into this song and to feel the movements and the rhythm of her words of oh, God's going to lift up the lowly. You know, God is going to save our people through this child. Um, that opens us up to the experience of other people, to be able to just hear this on uh, at, in our worship time together and think, huh, that might not be my song, but how can I, how can I connect with what she is feeling? Um, and how then can we think about our own world and 
what are the hopes that we have? What is the symphony that we um, are trying to create as a, as a community of faith? Um, you know, in our baptism liturgy, we talk about how we are becoming people who care for each other in the world God made and strive for justice and peace. What if that was kind of the tune that we are riffing on, mm -hmm. the tune that God kind of set or the rhythm God set, but we're the ones who are discovering that the contours of where that's going to take us in the world. And it breaks through all of our rigidities then to, to think of, you know, like that piano player in New Orleans who it's like, well, you can play it this way, you can play it that way, that there's no one right way, but we're all part of the same song and discovering our own our own way in it. I think that's a, a beautiful way for congregations as a whole to think about their place too um, in the midst of kind of a sense of competition for the hmm. who are the churchgoers. You know, we can get really competitive, um, but I think taking together this image of, of joining God's song and the image of John the Baptist pointing beyond himself to Christ is a really good lesson for congregations as a whole to take, to say, you have a place in the orchestra and your your version of the melody, your your place in that music is going to be sounding different than the, the church down the street or across the road or um, in another city. And that's okay. Like we're all part of the music together. And when it's not about us, when we can be John the Baptist and say, we are not the savior, we are not the end all be all of what church mm -hmm. is, but we are working to point you people who are encountering us to Christ and to God, um, pointing beyond the finite to the infinite. Um, then I think there there's more room for neighboring churches. There's more room for cooperation because we're we're not in competition so much. We're all doing the same work of pointing toward Christ, and we each have our own um, own vocalization of that work. At this time, in our time together, you are invited to set aside an offering to bring by the church mailbox or to send in the mail. We are so thankful for the gift of generosity that Concordia people have been showing uh, during this time of the year, uh, all years especially, but this time of the year as we have been through this challenging time uh, together. So continued thankfulness for all of you and for the gifts that you share. God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this weary world. 
Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, lectors, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship, especially our altar guild, sanctuary singers, and joyful voices. Embed your word in their hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and plants. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Lead them to a just administration of the coronavirus vaccine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for people whose lives have been upended by the pandemic. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and helpless, you clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Make your church a people of refuge and healing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testified to your radiant love, especially Lucy, martyr of the church. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior fill you with love. The unexpected spirit guide your journey, now and forever. Amen.
peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.